right, if you take your Bible, turn over to 2 Corinthians and go to chapter 8, if you would. If you find your place in 2 Corinthians 8, we've been looking through these chapters, and as we've looked at these, of course, Paul has defended his ministry, and now he's taking a little turn as he exhorts these believers, and it started, of course, in chapter 7, exhorting them, and he come into chapter 8, and he sort of starts off with a specific encouragement that he gives them about giving, and so we'll take a look at that. Let's have a word of prayer, and Lord, we would ask that you would tonight help us as we open your word, that you would challenge us, that you would send your word forth in our hearts, that definite needs would be met. We pray the Lord Jesus Christ would be lifted up, and even in this practical measure of giving, that our hearts would be stirred and helped. I pray that you'd cause us to want to grow closer to you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In chapter 8, you'll notice the verse begins with moreover. Now, Paul has defended his apostleship, and of course he has talked about the, uh, the separation issue in chapter 6 and even into chapter 7, and uh, how he had written this harsh letter, and he really brings the people back, looking back to how they had dealt with this in the church. But now he really changes gears and gives some practical uh, approach to some issues that were taking place in Corinth. Now, in, Cor in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians, the impression that I get is the church was in a far better state than it was when he wrote in 1 Corinthians. In fact, in chapter 7, we even talked about the man who was to be rebuked has now... Uh, started off on the, on the way to repentance and the church had dealt right with it. So the church that he is addressing here is in far better condition than the church that he addressed when it was 1 Corinthians. Same folks, but they have made some, some progress. But now the next step in their progress is this matter that he's going to deal with in chapter 8, which has to do with an offering. Now he is not specifically here encouraging these people to learn to tithe. He's not writing to them and telling them to start tithing. Probably they already did, and that was probably something that they were doing. But they had begun a special offering to help poor saints and had gotten distracted, had gotten off the path. And Paul writes and even says he's giving his advice, that is, as an apostle. He is giving godly counsel. He is giving direction that it would be good for them. It would be advantageous if they'd continue that offering, that God would use it. There's certainly a spirit as you read chapter 8 and chapter 9 that Paul is by no means writing and saying, if you don't continue this offering, then God's going to judge your church. But he does say, if you don't continue what you were doing, you are going to miss a great blessing. Right. You know, uh, I, I was reading a set of notes one time, or minutes, from a church. It was a church that had had some struggles. It was evident from the minutes. And I began to look through page after page as they would have quarterly business meetings. And the, the thrust of the meeting was the pastor who was moderating and the person writing the minutes were just putting down some notes about this. The thrust of the meeting is, look, we are, uh, if we don't get, so, you know, if money doesn't start coming in, uh, we're not going to be able to handle this particular bill. And if money doesn't come in, we can't take care of this. We're struggling to meet ends meet. The members are going to have to come together and really get serious about taking care of the church. And there's a spirit there that the pastor was somewhat uh, exasperated that there was just not enough money to meet the needs. Now, I don't know all the condition of that church, and certainly I'm not blaming the pastor, but isn't it tragic when God's people can't take care of God's work? You see, really, it is a reproach when God's people can't keep up what God is doing because there's no question what God orders, he pays for it. Now, that doesn't mean that we couldn't be out on a mission field and uh, a ministry would have meager income. We live in a blessed country. We have great jobs. We could be in a third world country. Certainly, we're not saying that because the church is blessed or has money in the bank or is able to do great things as far as expenditures and so forth, that that's the only way that God is honored. But we're saying that when, the, when there's a need and God's in it, God can meet the need through his people. Now, what that looks like can differ in, in different cultures. I'm sure there's plenty of churches that may be in third world areas that don't even have electric lights, but when the need is there, God can meet the need because he uses God's people to do it. Now, I look at this chapter, and I notice the emphasis on giving, and you know there is a balance when it comes to, to preaching on giving. We should never be afraid to preach any part of the Bible. But on the other hand, we don't necessarily want to just pick it out and hammer people with pet peeves and things that we need to go after. 
God needs to be in it. But you know, we shouldn't shirk from preaching something that is such a great blessing to the believer as the privilege of being able to give. If we believe what Paul mentioned to the Philippians over in chapter 4, uh, because I had a great need, because you communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. If we believe that it is a privilege to give and that God makes up where we come short, then we ought to preach what God has to say about it. Now, there's a key word in this chapter, and you'll notice this as we read in chapter 8. Notice in verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit. Now, that's an old way of saying we want you to be aware of this. We do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. In other words, we want you to know about this grace. Now, how in a great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. That is, even though they were impoverished, they were remarkable givers. He uses them as an example. For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. So they both gave what they had, and then Paul says they gave what they didn't have. They went beyond their ability. It says, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. This they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he had also finished in you the same grace also. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. You know what I find, the key word in that chapter, as I read through those few verses, is that giving is a grace. He said, as you've abounded in utterance and faith and knowledge and love to us, he said, there's another grace that you can abound in as well. You know, I can't uh, utter without God's help, without God's empowering. I cannot utter words that are helpful and eternal except God empower me to do it. I can't have really the knowledge of the Bible except the Spirit of God teach me spiritual truth and show me what this book means. And he says, equated with that, I can't really give and have it count for eternity without the grace of God in my life. Now, what a perspective to have as a Christian when we view giving as a grace. You know, I'll tell you what really is a great time to preach on giving is when you have the need met. You know, if, if tonight we were having trouble paying the light bill or we were struggling financially or there was difficulty making a building payment or whatever it might be, and I got up and preached this, somebody might scratch their head and say, well, he's trying to hit us over the head because, uh, you know, we're, we're slack and he's trying to get people to open their pocketbooks and perhaps try to use some illustrations to get you stirred up and think, oh, yes, we've got to give because the need is great. Let me say that a need is a good reason to give. God sometimes makes us aware of needs, and we give to those needs. Right. Who hasn't been in a service where a missionary got up and, and told us what God was doing on the mission field, and he says, I desperately need to get there, and there's a work to be done, and boy, the, later, the longer I tarry, the more uh, the work is being held up, and our heart is stirred, and we say, man, there's a need there. I want to give to that need. Or perhaps we look over at a, a need for space and we involved in a building program and we say, hey, there's a need beyond the bounds of our church and we need to meet that need. Yes, need is a reason to give, but it is not the best reason to give. The reason we give is, first of all, is because it's right to give. You know, if, if God never promised us a single thing but just says, I'm pleased when you give, that's a good enough reason to give. Now, as a church, we ought to be responsible we ought to be good stewards. I think probably it encourages us and certainly uh, motivates us to give to some extent if we feel like the money that's being given is being invested in the ministry and being utilized well, but we ought to give because God is pleased when we do. Now, a couple of things as we look at this, and we'll just sort of introduce this, and these, chapter 8 and chapter 9 really deal with this, so we'll have a couple of different opportunities. But I want you to notice, first of all, the means of giving because this is significant. He says in verse 1, Moreover, we do you to wit the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. You know why we're able to give today and why we're able to give well? It's God's grace. Now, grace is favor that God bestows that we do not earn. God empowers us to be able to do this. 
If God bestows this on us, we are simply being conduits. We are allowing God to give through us. So it is a, a means of grace. The source is the grace of God. But then I think about the power of grace. I see verse 2. How in a great trial of affliction and in the abundance of their joy and deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. How were people in deep poverty able to give and help other people who were in need? They were in need, but yet in the midst of their need, they gave. That's why he says they gave not only by their power, but they gave beyond their ability. When you do something beyond your ability, it takes the grace of God. Now that was an offering. It was not their tithing. It was not their general giving. They saw above what they normally did a need, and the churches in Macedonia were going through great trial of affliction. Probably some of them couldn't make money. Some of them didn't have jobs, but God allowed them to give. Now, if giving is a grace, and we are simply a, a conduit for God to give through, that means that it's not dependent on my ability, but on God's ability to give through me. Now, that shows us its power. And then I have a, a note here that not only the power uh, to... to to want to give, part of it is the desire, the grace of God to make me want to give. But you know, God's grace also gives me what to give. Turn for a moment, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. I want you to notice this. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus, speaking here about giving, and he gives us the proper order for the grace of God. He says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, you'll notice the order that Jesus gives, and we may take this for granted because we're familiar with the wording of this verse, but he did not say, as it's given unto you, distribute part of it. He doesn't say, as you get, Remember to give. Now, there are places in the Bible that tells us to remember the poor. There are places in here that tell us to be uh, th as far as alms, but this principle is different. This principle says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Do you see how the, the poor saints that were mentioned here that Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 followed that principle? They didn't have it to give, and they gave. Now, again, we're not talking about a tithe here. We're talking about an offering. We're talking about something they were not commanded to do, not something they had to do, but something God had burdened them to do. They wanted to be part of it. They got excited about it. They said, man, I would love to be a help to these poor saints, and I want to give something, and I don't really have it, but God, first of all, by his grace, gave them a desire to do it. So what did they do? They gave. When they gave, God kept his promise. Now, here's, here's the key to that. What is the key to grace? Is faith. See, how do you appropriate the grace of God? By faith. If I gave out of my abundance, that's not wrong. It's okay to give out of your abundance. But imagine what it's like to give when it's not there to give. You know, all of us have a realm of, of, of giving. You know, sometimes a person, we talk about this at Faith Promise. Some people misunderstand Faith Promise, and they say, oh, well, yeah, I'll fill out a card. I'll give $100,000 if God sends it to me. Well, no, that's not the idea. The idea is, I believe God would have me give, and that's specifically talking about faith promise. He's laid this on my heart, or either I'm willing to do it. It may not even be a, a, a vision from God, but I'm willing to do this. And yes, all of us would have to say, there's something else I could use that money for. I have another name on those bills there. I don't know a whole lot of us, just a handful, you know, Brother Potter or somebody has got a bunch of money just laying around who they just think, I don't have anything to do with this. I just think I'll do this with it. Not many of us are in that place. Most of us have a name on most of the dollars that we have, and we make a determination, wait a minute, I am going to reappropriate those, though I would use it somewhere else. I'm going to give first. Then what does God promise to do? Give unto you. Right. Now, the health, wealth, prosperity people say, oh, that means if I give, then God's going to make me rich. I mean, you know, the stock market only pays 10%. God's probably better than that, so I'll just invest my money in that and just watch it come in. God didn't promise to make you rich. He did say you give and he'll give it. Good uh, measure pressed over men shall give into your bosom. That's true. But all God guarantees you to do is you can't outgive him. Right. You won't miss it. He'll bring it back. He'll take care of you. 
you may not look at it from the accounting standpoint and not understand it. That is the miracle of grace. That is the presence of grace. So here a person says, well, yeah, that's, you know, I'm weighing my options. I can either not give and God won't give me anything, or I can give and then I might just wait and see what God will give me, but that's not why we give, is it? We give because we love the Lord. We give because we want to invest in the ministry. We give because we don't have any strings attached. God, I am willing to sacrifice to take a, a dollar I've got for something else that maybe would change my comfort or whatever it might be or even put me in a place where I'm actually having to pray for God to meet a need. But God, I'm going to miss, I'm going to reappropriate this and give it to you with no strings attached. That's my motive. But then I know at the same time, God says, my God is able to supply all your need. He will make it up when the need is there. Now, as I consider the grace of giving, I see this passage down here in verse 5 where it says in verse 5 that this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. And we'll touch that in a moment. Insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. You know what God used Titus to do? He said Titus had come in and influenced you and we trusted that Titus would, would take you to the next level of understanding what it meant to give. Because the Bible tells us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If giving is a grace and I grow in grace, then no doubt that's going to be one of the areas that God is going to teach me to do. Now, we often contrast the giving in the Old Testament and the giving in the New Testament. Now, this passage is not primarily talking about the tithe, but you can't talk about giving without talking about the tithe. Now, just very generally, God instituted the tithe in the law to take care of the Levites. We take that principle over to the New Testament, and we see some things that God says about giving, and part of it, we just understand the tithe is what takes care of the local church, the local ministry to invest in. You know, we could take our tithe and say, well, we need to take and pour every bit of this money into missions. Well, we are a mission. We're trying to reach our community. And we're trying to set up a base so if we can be strong that we might be able to over and abundantly take care of even reaching the world and, and supporting other missionaries. But the tithe goes into the general fund to take care of the needs of the church. Tithing is the baseline. Now, somebody says, well, the New Testament doesn't teach tithing. Well, let's stop and think for a moment. If I was going to pray and say, now, God, I know you'd have me give. Because most people who say tithing is just law, they believe you ought to give, but they say, well, you know, the tithing is just something that was established back in the Old Testament. It's law. Now, if I prayed and I said, now, God, I'm not sure what to give. I'm not sure what you would have me give. I'm not talking about an offering, but every week, out of what you give me, out of you take care of me, surely I'm supposed to give something to you. How much? The Old Testament, of course, it was a tithe. But what about the New Testament, Lord? What do I do? I'm a New Testament Christian. And I begin to pray and I begin to read the Bible. And I come to uh, Abraham over in chapter 18 of uh, the book of Genesis. And he meets the uh, Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God. And he gives a tithe. Now, that predates the law. This is Abraham. He gives a tithe. And I think, oh, well, at least we know Abraham kind of felt like Maybe a tithe is what he ought to give, but God, I'm still praying. What would you have me give? You keep reading your Bible, and you come over, and you see Jacob laying on that stone at Bethel. And he wasn't everything he ought to be, but he said, God, if you'll keep me in the way that I go and keep me from evil, everything I get, a tithe I'll give to you. And so you think, okay, well, you know, he's not. Maybe that was his opinion. Maybe that's just what Jacob thought, but Jacob felt like he ought to give a tithe. But after all, he wasn't everything he ought to be. So I'm still praying, God, what would you have me give? And I keep coming through the Bible, and I get over to the law. And I see that in the law, when God actually laid down for Israel what to give, he did require them to give a tithe. So I'm still praying about, well, God, what do you think percentage I ought to give? If I'm really seeking the Lord, it's pretty obvious to me. God's making it clear. I believe a tithe is a starting point. I mean, that's just where I start. God would have me give a tithe. Now, you say, well, isn't tithing, though, that's law. We're talking about grace. The difference in law and grace when it comes to a tithe is not the amount. God revealed to me what the starting point is. It is why you give it. Now, in the Old Testament, why did a person tithe? Because if they didn't tithe, there were earthly consequences to not giving that tithe. 
God demanded it. They had to do it. If they didn't give a tithe, they broke the law. There were consequences to breaking the law. Now, in the New Testament, God doesn't give me the same consequence. I'm not motivated by a law when I give in the New Testament. I said, we give by grace. We're wanting God to do this through us. All the tithe does is establishes God's starting point. For instance, I had a man come to uh, my office one time. He wanted to join the church. Now, he didn't have to tell me this, but he felt, I guess, obligated and he said, well, you know, I'd like to join your church, and we plan on joining him, but I want you to know up front, before we start, I do give, but I don't tithe. Now, I know probably why he told me that, is he figured after he started and the offering started coming in, I was going to look and see, you know, this name on here and say, oh, boy, that doesn't seem like he's giving a tithe. What he don't know is I don't have any idea what anybody gives, nor do I want to know. As I was told by a wise preacher, don't find out what people give. They call you at 3 o'clock in the morning, go to the hospital, and you know they don't give anything. You're going to be tempted not to go. So just don't, don't know what they give, all right? Uh, I didn't know what this fellow gave, but he felt obligated to tell me that. And I give, but I haven't come to the point where I feel like I can give a tithe. I just don't think I can afford to do that. Now, do you think I said to him, well, now, brother, if you're going to join our church, you know, we only allow tithers to join our church Obviously, if you're not do that, you're living in open rebellion to God, and I've read it before. Of course not. I equate it to this. A man may uh, sit down, and really what he wanted me to tell him is, uh, brother, I think that's perfectly fine. That's between you and God. You pray about it. I just accepted what he said because you could sit down in my office and say, look, I'd like to join your church, and I just want you to know up front, I don't believe in going to church all four Sundays a month. I just believe three out of four. I just don't feel like I'm at the point yet. Where I can do that, I just feel like three is sufficient. Now, of course, plenty of folks don't even come three. But, I mean, uh, if he told me that and, and defended it and says, for me, I've just prayed about it, and I just believe three out of four is sufficient, well, we'd say, well, no, I, I'm, I'm, you, of course you can join the church. I mean, that ain't going to keep you from coming. I hope you'll grow. I hope you'll make progress. I wouldn't say don't come at all until you can come all four. No, I'd say, well, I'm glad you're coming three. Maybe you'll hear something. God will work in your heart, and you'll grow. Man says, well, I just don't believe I, I give, but I'm not at a point of tithing. I don't say, well, if you can't give a tithe, then just don't even give because it doesn't mean a thing to God. People need to grow. But what I'm saying is don't try to blame it and say, well, that's just an Old Testament principle. Actually, the New Testament principle is 1 Corinthians 16. On the first day of the week, let every man lay by store as God has prospered him. You know, here a person makes $101.13, and he writes a check, for a hundred or, or for ten dollars ten point three cent and and you know I, I say give as God has prospered you just round the thing off to eleven dollars you know and if God blesses you next week with two hundred you don't just give twenty you might decide to give twenty five I mean just be uh, liberal and hey God's blessed me I want to I want to do whatever God leads me to do and be open it is a joy and a privilege to give so the difference in law and grace when it comes to a tithe is not the amount it's the motive you know, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't get uh, baptized to be saved. I got baptized because I am saved. I'm saved, and I wanted to show the world that I'm saved. I do not tithe just so I'm scared God's going to hit me over the head or I'm afraid my car will break down next week and I can't pay for it or somehow or another God will get his tithe back. I don't give for that reason. I give because I love the Lord, and I think it's a privilege to give. It's just part of what I do. It's a, it's a thrill to me. Now, that's a tithe, but we're talking about an offering. Now, he deals with this offering, but it does give us a contrast between law and between grace. So what is the, we understand the means is grace. What is the message? Well, look again at verse 5. It says, this they did not as we'd hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. You know what makes it no problem at all to give an offering? And you know, by the way, there's a difference in an offering and a tithe. Uh, a tithe is a starting point. God gave, here's what I do as a believer. And, and you know, if a person says, well, I'm not at the point of tithing, again, Christian growth, you give. As God uh, helps you grow and you make spiritual progress, there's your goal. Here's what I'm trying to do. You, you work to it as God gives you the ability to work to it. But then we come up and we say, you know what? Uh, we've had a special speaker in today. This man lives off of God's people taking care of him, and we're going to take an offering for him. You know, an offering is a free will offering. We pass a plate. Nobody's obligated. I'll guarantee you I don't sit in the chair and look out there and watch and see who's, 
who's giving or what's going on. I don't care. I just want you to obey the Lord. It's possible that you're not led to give in every offering. Can you believe a preacher said that? I mean, it's possible that you just didn't feel led today. God didn't lead. As long as you obey the Lord, that's all that matters to me. An offering is just that. It's a God leads me. I'd like to give something to it. And here's what I want to do. And that's an offering. Offerings take care of needs above the needs of the church. Now, faith promise, I'm not going to get in that tonight, is a whole other realm where you give beyond your ability to take care of missions. But that also is a faith promise offering. You see, once you get into this realm of it is a joy to give, here's where it comes from. They, first of all, gave them their own selves to the Lord. Because you know what really we are? We're stewards. See, God owns everything anyway. If I'm a Christian, I basically say, God, I'm thankful I can live in this house. And, and I'm, I enjoy it. And if I have any equity in it, I mean, it's not mine. It's yours. I just live here. God, I'm thankful that you've given me this car to drive. And if it made the bank may own more of it than I do, but, I mean, whatever's mine, it's not. It's yours. I mean, that moves even beyond money to, like I said this morning, these children you've given me, I love them. I'm thankful for the enjoyment of them. I hope I'll raise them right. But ultimately, they're actually yours. See, God owns, ought to own the title deed to everything that you have. You are simply the manager or the steward. Now, if the owner says, I'd like to shift some of my funds to this need, the steward doesn't have any argument, does he? The steward says, well, you know, I kind of enjoyed this little uh, Corvette you've had here and owned for some time. I like to drive it around, but if you decided you're going to give it away, hey, I'm just a steward. How can I argue about it? That's where you want to shift your assets? Then I'm okay with it. We give ourselves first to the Lord, and boy, everything else falls into place. You know, God is not going to... Uh, call upon you to do anything he's not going to supply. That's the bottom line. So he says, Titus, teach these people to grow. They'll give themselves to the Lord. They, they begin with sincerity, and they begin with, with, with honesty and with giving. And then we go back to verse 7 again. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. And then notice he says, I speak not by commandment but by the occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. You know, that's, that's talking about an offering. Paul's saying, look, I'm not telling you you have to give this offering. He said, I'm just trying to tell you that your stewardship, your giving, how you invest in the ministry is going to be a great blessing to you because the pocketbook is one of the, the first most simple ways and it's one of those things. You remember what Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And it is such a gauge of our love. And it's not the amount. It's not so much the percentage. It's not that God needs our money. Heavens knows. I mean, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. What does we have we could give him? If he was hungry, he wouldn't ask us. But Paul, as the apostle, says, I want you to, to get the blessing of this and be a part of it because it is part of the grace of God. Listen, I wouldn't tonight get up and make some kind of an audacious statement to say, if you don't tithe, then you're in open rebellion. Now, God teaches the tithe. It is disobedience. We ought to give, but people need to grow, don't they? There's somebody just got saved. They've been saved a month, and their budget is set, and they're spending every dollar they got right here. Could I tell them on the, on the uh, authority of the Bible, if you would just trust God today and take a step of faith and take a 10% chunk out of your budget and give it to the church Sunday, God will provide all your needs and take care of you. I could tell them that and I'd be accurate. But it's something else to be at a point where you're willing to do that. In other words, a person has to grow, don't they? Hey, let's give them room to move forward. Would it not be a victory if that person who had never in their life ever give a dollar to the church got saved and said, I'd like to do something, and they just began to give something? And then as they begin to give something in obedience, God began to stir their heart. Well, you know, I'm reading the Bible and God's working in me and it seems like I'm supposed to do this. And they've got a, a plan in their mind. Now, if they were a giant in the faith, they just took a leap. Hey, bless God, I'm going to give 10% this week and God will take care of me. Then that's good. They got that much faith. I don't know about you, but there's sometimes there's things I don't have much faith in. And I have to grow and study and ask God to help me and encourage me. And I look back and say, why didn't I just trust God? But the bottom line is I didn't. I had to grow to that point. 
So, yes, it is a matter of obedience. But far more than that, it's a matter of grace. It is, it is something, you know, I pray and ask God to make me a better soul winner. I pray God to make me holy. I can pray and say, God, would you help me to grow in this matter of giving? I can assure you I'm not today and I'm by any means trying to say, boy, we need to pad the church's account. We need to build up the... Uh, the savings we need to make sure we're getting for a rainy day and I'm trying to encourage you to give more because we need more I don't want you to miss the blessing of giving and by the way I don't think a church is a savings and loan either I don't think we build up a big old bunch of money in our account and save it there for a rainy day we ought to be conduits as a church of what God has blessed us with and take and take care of the ministry and move it through but I know that giving I mean, you even put this out on live stream. Somebody says, oh, yeah, Tri-City Baptist Church, just like all those churches, they're just trying to get people's money. No, God doesn't need our money. But what a blessing that we can be a part of what he's doing. And I trust God will burden us to do it. Let's go ahead and stop there tonight. Lord, thank you for the opportunity, for the power to be able to give by the grace of God. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we have abounded in these other areas of our life, that we would grow in all these areas, but as tonight, the emphasis that we would grow in the grace of giving. Lord, we know we've seen you meet our need. We know that we've seen you bless in many ways. So, Lord, I pray that you would just cement in our heart the need to be sensitive to your spirit. Where our treasure is, that's where our heart's going to be. So I pray we'd place it in your hand. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 476 tonight. As we turn to 476, as you're all on the altar, we'll stand and sing. If God's spoken tonight, we'd invite you to come and find a place of prayer. Amen. I stopped just a few minutes early tonight, give you an opportunity to fellowship a little bit. I hate to end that. It's an important part of our day. So take some time to fellowship for the next few moments. Then we'll call our business meeting to order in about oh, 10 minutes or so. Should be a fairly brief meeting. We'll finish that, and then we'll meet with our VBS workers, which I think also will be a brief meeting, and we'll get that uh, coming up next. So let's go ahead and have our uh, prayer time. Here we'll ask Eric Weatherington to close us in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the day that we've had together right, to fellowship think. together, to worship together, and to hear the preaching of the word. We pray that as we leave here tonight that you would uh, give us safety as we go to our homes. But, Lord, that the, the word of God that has been spoken would be in our hearts and be in our minds throughout this week. That we would uh, look for the opportunity to share uh, the truth of Jesus Christ with others that we come in contact with. And that we would uh, seek every day to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.